Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. It's commonplace these days to hear that human rights are in crisis. Without a doubt, these are challenging times, with human rights under pressure not only from the usual suspects, but also growing authoritarianism even within the liberal democratic heartlands. Add to this toxic brew a world of unparalleled economic inequality and the gathering storm of environmental crisis and the age of human rights so confidently declared by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at the close of the last century seems like an extraordinary statement of optimistic certainty, if not hubris. For some observers, the very concept of universal human rights is now suspect, too idealistic to survive the economic and political shocks of the past decade, or too wedded to a Western liberal ideology with imperial overtones. However, not everyone goes along with these critiques. Our guest today, Professor Rhoda Howard Harsman, a leading human rights scholar and the author of the book In Defense of Universal Human Rights, provides a powerful rebuttal to the philosophers and pundits who would question whether human rights can survive, or indeed, whether they are worth saving. So I've seen people claim that the civil and political rights are abstract. I mean, they are not abstract. And if you think they're abstract, then you really ought to go and do a survey of people in prisons all over the world who are being tortured and starved. And they would say, well, look at this concrete floor I'm sleeping on with dirt and filth all around it. It ain't abstract to me, is probably what they'd say. This is Imperfect Utopias or BUST, Global Governance Futures. Dr. Rhoda E. Howard Harsman is Canada Research Chair in International Human Rights and Professor Emeritus at the Department of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario, Canada. She is an internationally recognized human rights scholar whose many books and articles focus on issues as diverse as the right to food, women's rights, transitional justice and genocide. We spoke with her in March 2023. Well, we're delighted to have you with us, Rhoda. Uh, I I was able to read your fascinating book in defense of universal human rights recently. Uh, And, you know, I think it'd be great to perhaps kick off with a reflection, drawing upon your, you know, experience as a human rights scholar uh, over, well, some decades now, uh, and someone who you know, came of age, shall we say, in the in the sort of revolutionary sixties and seventies. I'll be curious to ask, how did that early experience on campus at McGill University, um, perhaps even early experience in terms of your family, the family context as well, how has that informed uh, your pursuit of human rights uh, in, as a as a as a field of scholarship, but also how did it inform your commitment to human rights? Well, so you may have read my biography, so you know that my father was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He was what was known as a Mischling or a half Jew. So, uh, as was normal, half the family probably escaped and the other half was murdered. Um, I was also raised not to know where I came from. And when I did discover that there were Jews in the family, I had to keep it hidden because my father was very afraid of anti-Semitism here. My mother was a Scottish uh, Labour Party activist, so at a very early age, I was aware of things like uh, the segregation problems in the United States. I remember looking at Emmett Till's photograph when I was about 10, and at the time he seemed like a very big boy to me, but I understood he'd been murdered for racial reasons. So, um, at McGill, yes, I mean, I was involved in foolishly and stupidly in in marches for Quebec uh, uh, separation. Um, I was once arrested in an all-women demonstration against a law banning demonstrations. Actually, I'm very proud of that. I think it was the right thing to do. I thought we had freedom of assembly in Canada at the time. It turned out we didn't. 
And the case that I was arrested in became an important case when we were getting our, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I also, like everybody else, demonstrated against the war in Vietnam. But, I mean, that was a minor thing in Canada compared to what was going on in Quebec. But I would say that... Um, you know, at the time, I defined myself as a Marxist, um, but, but it was all very silly. I mean, I had, you know, friends who were Marxist, you know, Maoist tendency, Marxist, Stalinist tendency. We had ridiculous discussions about whether Stalin was a, a good person because his troops had liberated the parents of some of my friends in concentration camps. Um but I think my background affected me more. So when I went to McGill, like anybody else, I wanted to see the world. So I did my PhD in Ghana. And my first book was called Colonialism and Underdevelopment in Ghana, which is actually going to be re, uh, reissued this year by Rutledge in a sort of historic colonialism series. Um, but when I came home, I wanted to put my brain where my heart was, since I didn't have any money to put it there. Um, so I did a couple of papers on Canadian refugee policy. And then I thought, well, th this is pointless because it, it doesn't address the underlying causes of why there are refugees. So since I had a background in African studies, I, I did a book on human rights in Commonwealth Africa. That was my second book. Then people start accusing me of being a sort of white Western imperialist type. So, or not really that so much as not understanding the importance of community, people who saw human rights as overly individualistic. So I wrote a book called Human Rights and the Search for Community, but people who were in African studies didn't read it because it wasn't about Africa. Um, and from then, as you probably know, um, I did a book on civic leaders in Canada and how they saw human rights. I did a book on... Um, on reparations to Africa for the slave trade, colonialism, and post-colonial period. Co-edited a book on the age of apologies, did a book on globalization, a book on state food crimes, and the book you've just mentioned. But I think the original input, I mean, there are many, there were quite a few people in my generation who were Jewish, who were refugees. The first UN uh, rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, who was... Um, Rodolfo Stavenhagen was actually a German Jewish child refugee, for example. The first UN rapporteur on uh, torture, Nigel Rodley, his father was a German Jew, killed in the war. So there was a sort of generation of us, I think, that, that went into that kind of universalist thought, as opposed to the people in Israel who have become right-wing fascist nationalist types, and I have no patience with, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Rhoda. So I guess one question is, when did you begin to identify as a human rights scholar? But to put that in a broader context, you did your undergraduate in political science, and then you began to specialize, or ma you majored in sociology for your master's, and then your PhD. And your supervisor was the great Emmanuel Waterstein, you know, one of the world leading sociologists, famous for his world systems theory. Um, Wallerstein himself wrote a rather curious little piece in 2018 called Human Rights Anyone, uh, which co coincidentally uh, is also when your book was published. Uh, and in that, he essentially makes a claim that ultimately human rights don't really add up to very much, that um, it hasn't achieved very much up to this point, and that as a category, human rights isn't particularly helpful if it's separated from a more complex analysis of the situation in any given political entity. And uh, yes, any given political entity, but it can't entirely stand by itself. And I was wondering whether that might have been the product of a conversation, perhaps. No, it wasn't. Oh, right. No, we, we, we lost contact. And I think it was probably mostly my fault. I was extremely young. And I was female, and I was extremely intimidated by Wallerstein. Everybody else, all the other grad students called him Emmanuel, and I never did. I was extremely intimidated by him. Um, but uh, you've asked me a lot of questions there. So the first one was, when did I identify as a human rights scholar? Uh, I started working on human rights after those two refugee papers, so probably around 1980. Um the interdisciplinary part, which you're asking me about, is kind of 
I, I never really thought of human rights as being confined to international relations. In fact, I don't understand why anybody would think human rights is confined to international relations because human rights, if you're going to achieve them at all, aren't primarily an internal matter. It's how societies evolve internally that's going to determine over probably centuries whether they're going to be a rights protective society. And it seems to me a kind of hubris that we should think that international relations has much to do with it through foreign aid or through um, sanctions or whatever. It seems a kind of hubris on the, on the part of powerful Western states to think that uh, that's going to affect human rights. On the disciplinary thing, aside from that, I just read what I thought I needed to know. And that's probably a weakness as, as well as a strength. But my first book, which is was my, thesis, my doctoral thesis under Wallerstein, was basically history. I spent 15 months in Ghanaian and, and British archives. Other books drew more heavily on sociology. My book on civic leaders drew almost entirely on um, interviews with them. I wish you'd sent me um, Wallerstein's uh, um, article so I could have read it first. I mean, Wallerstein is right. I think that I mean, I think there's way too much emphasis on human rights law, for example. I mean, you can't, for example, we have a human right to development, which is really a human right not to be exploited by other people, I think is what it's, it's meant to be. But that's not what development is. If you want to look at a, a just how you get a just society, you've got to study history, you've got to study economics, you've got to study sociology as well. Um, where I diverged from Wallerstein, I mean, 40 odd years ago, was that I thought he spent, he did not um, focus too much on internal social change. Um, I, I wrote a very long critique of Wallerstein for my last doctoral a comprehensive paper. And if you told me about this, I would have read it before I, before you, I talked to you. Um, but I think basically I, I was just too shy and intimidated by him to uh, maintain contact, which is unfortunate. Okay. Well, let's get into it. I mean, I, I, I agree with you that the notion that human rights are really a matter of foreign policy, international relations is kind of, it's, it's a, it's a curious artifact of mainly American social science approaches to human rights and doesn't bear much relationship to the reality of human rights practice, uh, you know, where, where sort of the rubber hits, hits the road. Um, and you've made a strong case for, the idea of universal human rights against those who would argue that they're they're really context dependent, that they're sort of political constructs. Um, I mean, how 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 do you advocate for this universalization of rights in this age of you know cynicism around these sorts of terms? And and as you said, the the the, the very large kind of pushback against sort of Western imperial um, paradigms that human rights has got entangled with within. Well, there's three answers to that. One is the actual history and politics of the um, creation of a human rights regime. So, in as a matter of fact, 56 countries or their representatives were involved in uh, drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, and a lot of them were not Western. Two of the women who, who really pushed the men to include women's rights in the Declaration were from India and the Dominican Republic. Um, the main groups that were excluded were sub-Saharan Africa, which was colonized, and indigenous peoples who don't have states. The draft, the original draft UDHR, drafted by the Canadian lawyer um, Humphrey, um, drew is, uh, very heavily from Soviet bloc and Latin American constitutions, which is why economic, social, and cultural rights are in it. 
The reason their uni- rights are considered universal as opposed to um, only for people who do not live in colonies, because originally the British and the French wanted to exclude colonial subjects from this, was because of pressure from people from the colonies saying we want the rights for ourselves too. Subsequently, once all these sub-Saharan Africa, or most of the sub-Saharan African countries also became independent, every country in the world has been involved. So that's just the history of it. Now, of course, all governments are supremely hypocritical. That isn't news. So this is a set of principles which governments claim they agree to, but they don't. Right, even Canada goes on and on about how open it is, but right now we have an immigration so-called crisis, and people are talking about closing the border as a result. This is one. There's a border crossing where people can come through. Anyway, okay, that's one. Two. There's a severe lack of knowledge about the West and the history of the Western world. So I've seen people claim that civil and political rights are abstract. Well, when the philosophes and the philosophers were talking about human rights, they weren't abstract. People were being tortured. People were being subjected to arbitrary execution. Voltaire, according to Lynn Hunt, was very concerned about a particular case where somebody was going to be tortured to death. I mean, they are not abstract. And if you think they're abstract, then you really ought to go and do a survey of people in prisons all over the world who are being tortured and starved and subjected to extremely degrading traditions. And you could go and ask them. Are human rights abstract or are they concrete? And they would say, well, look at this concrete floor I'm sleeping on with dirt and filth all around it. It ain't abstract to me is probably what they'd say. Okay, the third thing is culture. And I've been listening to this critique for years. I remember an African man in 1980 at a conference telling me that African women did not need human rights. So I went back to campus and I asked my Zambian student, do you think you don't need women's rights in Zambia? And she said, my brother-in-law beat my sister to death, but the baby lived and he took it. So there's a story. Now, by, by 1990, there were a whole bunch of African feminists who were demanding rights. So it's, you know, the idea that, that cultures must be preserved, even if they, even if they violate human rights, it does not persuade me. Canadian culture in 1950 was racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, and misogynistic. Nobody goes around saying it's a real shame that Canadian culture has changed because of human rights over the last 70 years. Right? Actually, I could say maybe even uh, 1970. And then, of course, there's the indigenous people. So this cultural argument bothers me. I agree that we should respect other people's cultures. And I think there's a lot to be said for cultures that are more communitarian than than some of the uh, more libertarian aspects, especially of the United States. I think communitarianism is an important part of, of social commitment. You have to understand that you live in a community and you have to have commitment to the, to the well-being of everyone in that community. So, I mean, it, bothers me enormously that in the United States, libertarianism has taken over where there's no sense of commitment to anyone but your own self and your own family. And that libertarianism is now um, becoming a prominent strand in Canadian politics as well. But I'll give you an example. Mark Goodale in his uh, one of his later books, latest books perhaps, talks about the difficulties in places like Fiji and Papua New Guinea with... Um, international norms that violate traditional cultures. So in Fiji, there's a culture called, a cultural practice called Bulu Bulu, in which if a woman is raped, the rapist has to pay compensation to her family. And apparently the UN High Commission, the UN CEDAW Committee has criticized that. Well, does this woman have the right to say, hey, I'm a female. I don't like being raped. Punish the guy. Or maybe she'd just like to take the dough for herself. If you're going to pay compensation, I'll take it. Because I've got to raise the kid that this guy made me have because he raped me. Same thing with um, another custom Goodell mentions in Papua New Guinea. 
tribe A, so to speak, killed somebody in tribe B, or ethnic group A killed somebody in ethnic group B. Ethnic group B said, well, we don't want compensation. So ethnic group A said, okay, we'll give you a girl here and she can marry one of your old guys. This girl went to court with the help of NGOs and the Papua New Guinea judge ruled that she couldn't be forced to marry the old guys. Forced marriage. So Goodell talks about that, but he doesn't say what he thinks should have happened. Does he think that this woman should have been forced? He, you know, he complains that, that the judge was looking at international norms, but he doesn't say whether he thinks this woman should have been forced to actually marry this old man. And whenever I read this stuff, I'm saying to myself, but what about women? But what about women? But what about women? Because one of the big cultural things is the treatment of women. So, um, my view is that in these kinds of cultural cases, the individual should always have the chance to opt out and say, I know it's our norm, but it ain't mine, so to speak. Uh, I also think there should be a right of exit, but I think that that's problematic because it essentially face, make, makes people refugees from their own cultural communities. So, yes, culture is important, but culture is also used um, in a very cynical way. As we know, for example, Russia now says, well, our culture is that we're not going to um, respect gay rights. It's not part of our culture. Well, they're right. It wasn't part of Canadian culture until maybe maybe 30 years ago. Um, so if you're going to play that kind of culture game, then you've got to look at the cultures of Western societies as well. And you can't criticize Western societies' cultures and not criticize other people's cultures. Well, that's a very helpful uh, provocation, Rhoda. Obviously, <laughs> you know, Mark Goodell isn't here. It'd be wonderful to host you both for a debate at some point <laughs> on that on that question. Uh, yeah, so I think, to, you know, to pick up on a, a few strands there, I mean, one is this idea of human rights is really, you know, this is, these are deeply held, pragmatic, shared concerns. And when you're confronted with a violation, you know it's a violation. Uh, so the philosophy kind of takes a back seat at that, at that, at that moment. So that makes sense. Um, but help me understand this a little more. I think you're also saying that we need to get a better understanding of Western history, that the idea that human rights is, is essentially sort of a, a Western imperial project overlooks the fact that actually human rights has been, ha has been part of internal struggles and internal violations and abuses of authority throughout Western history, which I think Michael Goodhart also argues that he sort of says that human rights were invented in the 17th century as a response to domination and oppression by the church and, and so on. Where I struggle a little more is when the anthropologists come in and they say, but hang on a second, indigenous people, they never invented a social contract. They never dreamt of a, a, a Lockean state of nature. Um, you know, they don't have the, the, the institutional, historical, political, cultural uh, uh, um, legacy that, that, uh, that invents this formulation of, of human rights. And um, as such, it, you know, it, sort of, it is imposing a category onto a context which has no, there's no fertile ground for that category to be grafted onto. So Aboriginals, for example, apparently don't have a word for human rights. There's no straightforward translation. So I'm just curious, how do you respond to those sorts of... Well, again, terms? I think uh, Goodale had a I just reviewed this book. That's why I can think about it. Uh, Goodale has a conversation with somebody in Colombia and he asks him to um, explain human rights. And Goodale says, well, human rights mean everybody's the same. And the guy says correctly, no, they're not. Everybody is not the same. But you could say to him, everyone is the same in their suffering. Everyone starves when they don't have food. Everyone is in pain when they're tortured. Grandmothers are in pain when their children are taken away by the military. I mentioned this because in 89, I met the, um, the then head of the African Commission for Human Rights. And he said, you know, the grandmother in the village doesn't have any idea what human rights are. And I thought, well, the, the grandmother does if it means her grandchildren are starving or if her grandchild is murdered by the military. Then you would say that what this concept means is that this should not happen. Right? It's not just a philosophical concept. You don't have to know all about Western philosophical history 
to understand what human rights are. I do. Not, I am not a philosopher, and Michael Freeman once criticized me for not knowing enough philosophy. Fair enough. Um, but we do know that Western history, Western is the West is not a timeless, non-historical, non-political, socially undifferentiated place. Right? So we know that there were there were there was terrible oppression in the West. We know that most of our ancestors were extremely poor. Um, and were oppressed by kings, the church, their feudal landlords, or whomever. Most people in Canada, which is a country of immigration, are maybe two generations away, or maybe three from poverty and oppression. Uh, white people, I'm talking about white European and British immigrants. So there is a whole tradition in the West of fighting against feudalism, fighting to, to be freed from the oppression of the church, feminism, trade unionism, concern for the poor, and so on. And this is, this is obscured by a notion of what I call Occidentalism, by a notion of the West as just this timeless, ahistorical place. Um, I think people should know their own histories. And I think Southern, Southern uh, historical and political and economic alliances are a very good thing. But I also think people should know what Western history is. And it's not ideas, it's fact, it's practice, it's what actually happened to people. It's not Locke or Hobbes sitting around thinking about what we need only. Most people who fight for human rights don't have a clue about what these people thought. Plus, in any case, there are people like Amartya Sen who um, point out that there were ideas of what sort of became human rights in Indian culture. And there were some very liberal maharajas and so on. So you can find that anywhere. And the same people who might say indigenous people don't have a social contract will proudly say, I don't know if it's true or not, but they will proudly say that the Americans took some of their constitutional ideas from the Six Nations. Six Nations are a group of six indigenous nations who live actually where I live in southern Ontario, who are not, in, uh, I think, indigenous to the in the sense that they've been here for, for, for millennia. They came up, they were loyalists, some of them, to the Americans, to the British, and they came up after the American Revolution. But so there are such ideas. And then there are indigenous women who will say, well, we have these problems. If we have healing circles for rapists and they let them out, they might rape again. There have been disagreements in Canada among indigenous groups, among people within indigenous groups. There have been indications in Canada that in some indigenous societies, one particular family may have a lot of privilege and another family in that society does not have the same amount of privilege. Everyone in the world is likely to behave pretty well the same way. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to jump in here. And, and firstly, I, I want to wish you a happy International Women's Day. And I'm really glad <laughs> you're talking about, about women's rights. It's really important. And I think one question I want to start with first, I guess, would be, in in a in a review of, of your book and a, and, and another of uh, and a, a few other human rights books, um, one of the the charges um, that the, the author mentioned um, was that human rights have ultimately been irrelevant to women's issues, um, or they haven't had enough of an impact in ameliorating the conditions of women globally. And so, I'd be interested in in your uh, I guess perspective on that. A, and then secondly, and and then obviously answer these separately. Um, I'm really interested, I guess, in the nation state as the kind of protector and violator of human rights. Um, and hearing your your kind of biography at the beginning reminded me of Hannah Arendt's piece, We Refugees, which points out specifically that the refugee is the, is, is the to use Agam Ben's term, like homo sacca, the bare human, those that don't belong to a nation state, and therefore somehow are those that are most endowed with the universal basic human rights and yet have nobody to protect them. And so in our current climate of climate migration and refugee crisis across a number of borders, be that in Europe or the Sahel or at the Mexican-US border or in um, even Eastern Europe, um, how does the refugee highlight the, the, I guess, paradox between 
nation states as human rights protectors and, and violators. To say that human rights haven't well helped women is ridiculous. It's fair to say that women still have a long way to go. Um, but if I look at my life in, 19, in 1960s in Quebec, first of all, the reason I'm a professor was because it was very hard for women to go to law school. So my choice was to be a teacher, a secretary, a nurse, or a librarian. So I literally fell into graduate school because there was nothing else to do. And I'm not the only Canadian woman of my generation that says that. Secondly, I lived in a province where a woman could not have surgery unless her husband gave her her permission, his, his permission. I lived in a country where a ma married woman could not have her own credit card. I lived in a country where a woman could not have an abortion. It was illegal. I just discovered the other day that I was committing crimes when I was a young girl because twice I helped other girls try to find an abortion. One time unsuccessfully, one time successfully. So, and I actually, come to think of it, paid for those abortions. So I was actually committing a crime when I was 18 or 19 years old. Never occurred to me before. Um, so there's been a lot that's changed since then in this liberal democracy. Right? If you want to look at the rest of the world, where people are not fortunate enough to live in liberal democracies. As I mentioned, there's a, there's a strong feminist movement in Africa. It is simply not true to say, as some people still do, that the campaign against female genital, genital mutilation is a Western cultural imposition. It is an African campaign. And it's an African campaign that has had results. And the rate of uh, FGM is declining in countries in Africa that used to to practice it. There are a lot more professional African women. Again, among indigenous societies, there are a lot more professional indigenous women. The key to, to social change, and one key to social change, is to have a highly educated elite that knows the law and that can argue with uh, the oppressor, so to speak, on their own terms. And that is evolving more and more and more now. I met a young chief, for example, uh, Indigenous chief here in Canada was a, a young woman, youngish woman in her 30s with a law degree. So she knew what she was doing when she argued for her community's rights. So you might argue that the rights paradigm is not the only paradigm, and I would agree with you. It is one tool in a toolbox for social change. Demonstrating on the streets at great risk is another tool for social change. Organizing NGOs, which may or may not use human rights language, is another tool for social change. But at the same time, we now see evolving human rights to things like climate change, to development, to the clean environment, which shows you that NGOs will use that kind of language if they think it has a resonance. And then you see people at the UN making big, long speeches about how this is a right um, which they didn't do before. So I, you know, and then the other thing is violence against women. Actually, when you look at the UN Declaration on the Rights of Women from 79, nothing about um, abortion, still don't have a, a right to abortion, nothing about lesbian rights, nothing about violence against women in those declarations. It was all development or pretty well all development, development and equality. Then you have the UN uh, 1993 conference, the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, and Charlotte Bunch, formerly a member of SCUM, the Society for Cutting Up Men in the 1960s, re-emerges as the organizer of a parallel conference on violence against women. It's a very powerful parallel conference. She produces a movie. The first person to speak in the movie is this tall, blonde, beautiful American person. I'm, I'm watching it. I'm thinking, what's she doing there? And then she tells us that her stepfather raped her for many years systematically. Within a year of Charlotte Bunch organizing that conference, there was a UN declaration on violence against women. So people use the language and it's useful. Now, as for refugees, I'll just see if I can find my quote here. Okay, shortly after his arrivals in Switzerland in 1939, Helmut Hassmann, a 25-year-old refugee from Germany, 
wrote a short memoir of his escape by Italy and Yugoslavia, his months in prisons, and his fruit, fruitless attempts to attain, obtain legal papers, either to stay in Italy or migrate elsewhere. Being stateless, my grandfather was Russian, as was my father, even though his country of birth was Germany. I was unable to obtain any residence or work permit abroad. You're so utterly powerless, so impotent. Whatever happened to human rights? Is there such a thing anymore? Is it not a mockery of all humanity when today millions are forced to wander about aimlessly, when every country spits them out again? like outcasts. Now, as you may have gathered, that was my father. And he wrote that in a memoir after he got to Switzerland and somebody, I found it many years later and somebody translated it for me out of German. So yes, one of the biggest problems we have is international apartheid. Basically, if you have a British or American or Canadian or such citizenship, you're on the, on the, the benefited side of apartheid. Otherwise, you're on the, on the, the side that loses um, so that's, that's one of the biggest problems we have. Um, every country controls its borders, not just Western countries. There were big expulsions, for example, from Ghana to Nigeria in the early seventies, retaliatory expulsions from, from Nigeria to Ghana. I had a colleague who was a son of a Nigerian trader. They were living in Ghana and they were kicked out when my colleague was about six years old. Um, more and more within Africa. A political tool is to claim that somebody is not really an indigenous Malawian or Zambian or whatever because his grandparents or great grandparents migrated at a time when there were no borders. We have the same problem with now Haitians in the Dominican Republic. So it's not just a Western problem. Um, but you're right. I mean, uh, that's why I read you the quote from my father. He was barely human, right? He didn't exist. He had no papers. Um, so the state is indeed as known as a protector and violator of human rights. I would be more likely to say that it's maybe 70% violation and 30% protector, um, even in, in, in the, the Western world. I mean, in here in Canada, we violate all sorts of people's rights. We, we violate the rights of the poor. We give them welfare payments that are derisory. They actually have to either, they can either eat or they can have a house to live in. That's it. Uh, we have a practice which I learned to call social murder. Social murder is when you give somebody so little money that he has to sleep outside in order that he can eat. And the result is he's going to have a very low life expectancy. Um, so, you know, we have all those problems. And as I said, Canada now, Canada routinely, when we start getting large numbers of immigrants we don't want, imposes visas on the countries producing the immigrants. Um, so what we go for is rich professional immigrants who speak English or French already. So um, that's that's the side of looking at the UN and seeing it as a supremely hypocritical organization. I mean, not just the um, the Security Council, which obviously is hypocritical, or the General Assembly, where countries will vote for all sorts of things they don't believe, but also the Human Rights Council. And which countries the uh, Human Rights Council will condemn and which won't condemn. I contem condemn Israel's treatment of the Palestinians very strongly, but I also condemn the continued preoccupation with Israel at the expense of countries that are doing even worse things. Um, the fact that Michelle Bachelet had to re uh, issue her report on the Uyghurs in China, I, I think it was, one minute before her term ended. This shows you the monumental hypocrisy of the UN, which doesn't mean I think you should go quit your job after this interview. Um, I think it means you have to keep working and working and working to, to try to reform things. Rhoda, I'd like to pick up the, the question of the state as protector or violator and your 70-30 ratio on that question. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I struggle a bit with this. So um, what is the role of the state when it comes to the protection of human rights? And if we think of human rights as political, what is really the political foundation of human rights? I mean, some people would say that human rights are, are protections against abuses by the state, not 
abuses by private individuals. And in that respect, they were, they relate to the, the conditions of legitimacy that a liberal democratic government um, has to observe if it is to wield that power legitimately. So in that sense, um, they're sort of tied in with, they are very much tied in with the social contract. You know, the, the state observes your rights in exchange for your allegiance. I think this is a very yeah. powerful kind of myth. It's a very powerful myth that hardly anybody knows about. If I went to my, the people I interviewed, the 78 civic leaders here in Hamilton that I interviewed in the 90s and told them what you just said, they'd say, what? Right. Their answer might be, oh, do you mean that as long as I pay taxes and obey the law, it's OK? That, that might that that would be their standard answer to that. I mean, we think or you think in those terms, but ordinary people do not think in those terms. They do not think they have a social contract. And sometimes they get confused if the state then says you do have a contract with us. Therefore, there's a war going on. Therefore, you have to sacrifice your 18 year old son. They say, well, what's going on here? I never knew that I would have to either risk my own life or risk my child's life in order to live in Canada. Right? And we haven't done that yet with regard to uh, Ukraine, but it, it may come up. Um, the, yes, the state, I mean, a liberal, this is what I mean by talking about the internal evolution. You can't get anywhere unless you have a society that, that has a culture of the, the cultural, a, right, a rights protective culture, right? A culture that says um, everyone deserves human rights. But then you have to look at how that evolves and where it comes from. Without that cultural foundation, then Wallerstein is right. Goodale is right. Without that cultural foundation, human rights aren't going to mean much mean much. But the cultural foundation also arises from human rights tribunals, from judges, from the law, from public figures who talk about human rights, um, who try to push people on human rights uh, agendas, who journalists who, who um, point out that there, when there are human rights violations. All of that is part of the culture. The NGOs are part of the culture. Women sitting around talking are part of the culture. You know, um, men, I guess men actually do sit around talking about these things sometimes, too. Uh, you know, men sitting around talking about it are part of the culture as well. Um, so where we got where we got we got to the social contract here. Um, so what were you? What yeah, were you let, let me add let me add a little bit more meat um, to the bones there. So, you know, we know there's no view from nowhere. And I was reading a little bit into, into the 1960s and 70s, the anti-colonial struggles of the time. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't really aware that uh, human rights within that context was really tied to the question of self-determination. And at that, at that time, the anti-colonial struggle really saw statehood as a, an emancipatory agenda, which is a very different understanding of human rights, uh, you know, the sort yeah, of... Yeah, and some people... Some people would argue that that's still all that human rights means for people in the former colonial world. Um, um, you know, they, they wanted sovereignty. And so you've got Article 2 of the UDHR, which, which talks about that. Um, so th those people believed that it was a first step. Some of them believed it was an only step. After that, you got all sorts of, of anti-colonial leaders who became extremely corrupt in their own way. Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, who's considered a big hero, but was actually very oppressive. Um, Kaunda in Zambia, Nyerere in Tanzania, they all became oppressive in their own right. But again, this is human behavior. It's not African behavior, it's just human behavior. Um, other people involved in those struggles may have continued. I mean, in the early years of the post-colonial period in English-speaking Africa, it was judges, lawyers, and journalists. Those were the people who talked about human rights, and therefore were the people who got thrown in jail often as well. Um, it wasn't public discourse. There was a defi definite division between big men and small men, and then a further you know, separation between men and women, of course. Um, but it it doesn't mean that that these ideas have no resonance now. 
we haven't been living in a world in which people are isolated from each other. We have been living in a world in which people have been having these discussions across borders for 40 or 50 years. The women's movement's been having these discussions for 40 years. And not only across borders, but within borders between black feminists and white feminists. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think it has resonance, but I, I, I keep getting back to the idea of people's practical everyday lives. Right? When I interviewed my civic leaders about gay rights, this was in the mid 90s. So we still we didn't get gay marriage in Canada till 10 years later. Several of them said things like, well, I'm thinking through. Well, there's a guy down the hall where I work and I've just found out he's gay and he's a really nice guy. And I really have to start thinking again. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm thinking about what we should do as a church for gay people. Even a guy who came from, from India, a Sikh guy, when he was 15, when I interviewed him, he was eight, 28. He said he had been shocked when he came to Canada, but then he started thinking about it. So, I mean, we ought to get off this idea that philosophers determine everything. Philosophers determine very little except as it applies to other philosophers and philosophy students, right? Sometimes politicians and political elites obviously pick up on these, di these ideas, but ordinary people live ordinary lives. To, to come in there, and, and I think that this, this is a good time to, to ground this in something real, um, it's been oft said that civil and political rights have been prioritized at the expense of economic and social rights. And I know this is something that you disagree with, um, but I would like you to explain that critique and, and why you think it's misguided. Um, and then I'd like to probably respond with grounding in a situation like America or even the UK, where you have oligarchic media capture where actually you could argue that the political rights afforded to individuals in these liberal democracies aren't particularly strong, um, then actually the social and economic rights sh should be prioritized above the political or, or just, yeah, if you could talk about that issue. I, I think look, you can't, you can't eat what well, you can eat, but you can't be sure you're going to be able to eat if you don't have the right, especially to freedom of speech. Right? So the countries that I looked at when I wrote state food crimes, one of the things that was clear in all of them was people were being denied completely their civil and political rights. So I worked on North Korea. Right? When I was working on North Korea, my research assistant said to me, I should take out the bits about cannibalism. And I said, no, I'm leaving them in. Because you have to understand, people have to understand the situation is so bad in North Korea that cannibalism is occurring. Cannibalism occurred in the Ukraine during the Holodomor in the 1930s. The Soviets had posters that said, eating people is wrong. Eating your children is wrong. They actually had posters saying you're not supposed to do that. So North Korea is an example of a society where there's a massive starvation and malnutrition and where there are absolutely no civil and political rights. So you can't say, hey, I would like to get a different opinion on this, or I would like to give you my opinion. The other countries I worked on were Zimbabwe, where uh, a um, policy of depriving white owners of their land had the effect of malnutrition among black people not only because their white owners had a lot of employees who lost their jobs, but because the amount of food that was being produced it declined, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, and prior to that policy, Mugabe was introducing more and more restraints on civil and political rights, on the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and so on. Then the other, another example was Venezuela, the same thing. When I worked on that, I, I was doing my research to 2015. So um, policies, uh, food policies combined with denial of civil and political rights were resulting in severe shortages of food. Malnutrition and starvation were starting in 2015. Now, as you know, there are millions of refugees. These people are fleeing because they can't eat and they can't eat 
because they are not allowed to complain. They're not allowed to, to talk about different ways of doing things. It's also true that they've lost their land and so on. Right? The last case I looked at was Israel in the West Bank and Gaza, where there was no starvation, but there was malnutrition and much higher rates than in other Arab countries. And again, it's a combination of Israel, Hamas, and Fatah, but people do not enjoy their civil and political rights in those areas. So I started on this in, 2000, in 1983, and I started with a quote from Nyerere, who said, when a man's belly is, is, isn't full, he doesn't care about civil and political rights. But in fact, Nyerere was depriving people of their land. He was engaged in a forced resettlement policy, forcing uh, peasants from, uh, to, to move from the areas where they were used to cultivating into areas where um, they had access to schools and uh, clinics, but they're, they're, um, they couldn't cultivate. They didn't know how to use the land there, or it was the wrong kind of land. So, I mean, again, I talked about social murder here in Canada. Homeless people, the extremely poor, have advocates. We have a very strong social democratic party here, but it's not strong enough. It's not in government. It's not raising these people's uh, incomes. We could have a basic income policy. We had it during the pandemic, but it's, it's gone now. And so these people, I mean, if you're a family with children, you're probably fine. But if you're a single man and you're homeless, that's it. Um, so as for as for oligopoly of the media, of course you're right. But to say that capitalism exists and to say that co corruption exists isn't to say human rights are bad. It's to say they're good. It's to say we need more protections about this against this kind of thing. Right? We're moving towards fascism in the United States. It's extremely dangerous. I'm sure that uh, Trump would have completely shut down the independent critical media if he'd, if he'd been allowed to, but he wasn't. Right? That would have been one of his first things that he would have wanted to do. Um, but that's to say we need more human rights. These are arguments for an independent media. These are not arguments against them. And these are arguments for the right to freedom of speech, not arguments against them. If we don't have the right to control, to criticize capitalism here or state capitalism in China or oligarchs in, in Russia, then we're a lot worse off than we were before. What you're saying is that human rights don't solve all, all problems. And I agree with you. I agree with you. I would like to see the governments of China and, and, and the current governments of China and, and Russia overthrown. I'd like to see the current government of Israel elected out of power permanently. You know, I would like to think that the United States would go back to nice Obama type Democrats, but unfortunately, right now we're in a very dangerous situation. And I think uh, on that, the multiple crises, everything that, that's occurring at the moment, we, we have this notion that human rights is at a crossroads. And, and I guess I've facetiously written down, has human rights ever not been in crisis? You know, has there ever been a period of history where people have gone, oh, you know what, things are, things are fine right now. I guess with human rights, things can always improve. Um, but at the moment, what is your diagnosis? How do you see things going? And what would your advice be to those that, that really do believe in the universality of human rights? Well, what is it that we can do to drive this forward? Or, or where does the UN need to be more effective? Or who, well, yeah. That's two different questions. So um, on the UN, I'm not an expert on the UN. Obviously, the Security Council needs to be reformed. But I don't know whether things would get any better if India and South Africa were on the Security Council. Um, I'm sure that they would act in their own interests or what they consider the interests of the regional bloc, just like other people do. So supposing we add India and Brazil and South Africa and I don't know which which Arab country would you like Saudi Arabia you're, you know <laughs> which one do you want to add there I mean so this obviously extremely hypocritical and so is as I said the the I don't have much use for I'm sorry for the Human Rights Council I, I really don't I have a lot of respect for the UNHCR and the UN High Commission for Human Rights but I don't have much respect for the Human Rights Council when I look at the list of countries that are on it um what you do, I mean, as younger people, I mean, 
there's two parts to this question. And one of them is try not to get discouraged, but that, that depends on one's personality and one's background and so on. Um, my general advice when I was still teaching was look outward as much as you can. Don't look inward. Um, look at and see no matter how badly off you are, if there's someone else you can help. One of the people I interviewed was a man who was blind and who nevertheless did volunteer work, a man in his, I don't know, 40s or 50s. Um, I would think that what you and 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 Tom Pegram are doing is the right thing to do. Um, I don't know how many students over the years I said, don't think that doing a PhD is the end of the world or is the best thing you can do. Don't think that becoming a professor is the best thing you can do. The professoriate is, is very competitive. In, in the United States, it's extremely competitive and extremely nasty, as far as I can tell. In Britain, it's no guarantee of a secure job anymore. So, I mean, what you're doing, working at the UN, working in NGOs, journalism, um, and, um, well, actually law, as I said, I... I at the time I graduated from my first degree, it was pretty well impossible for women to go to law school, although some did. And one of them became, a couple of them became Supreme Court justices. One of them was Louise Arbour, who worked in the UN system for quite a while. Um, but I, I would think uh, law, journalism, working for NGOs, working in government, working for UN is a, a much better alternative. Or even the kinds of things that you're doing in your outfit with policy briefs. Also podcasts, everything you're doing makes absolutely good sense to me. Communicating in non-traditional academic formats, going into non-traditional, well, not going into government NGOs and so on. That's what you can do. How you prevent yourself from sinking into despair I don't know. I mean, my own rule was never re re read about genocide after nine o'clock at night. You know, go watch a, a mystery program on TV or, or read a stupid novel. Uh, people used to ask me that because I was always dealing with awful things. I said, just read stupid novels at night. Not the, not the worst kind of novels, but, you know, not heavy stuff. <laughs> and have a life. I mean, have a private life. That sounds like very wise advice, Rhoda. That's the old lady yeah. advice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're drawing to a close. Do you have any final thoughts or anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Yeah, I do, because I went through the questions and uh, there's several that, that you... Um, you asked, and I wanted to ask. So one of them was that the tra you had asked me about uh, the challenge of traversing disciplinary silos and historical epochs like the, the end of history. So, in fact, the work I did wasn't affected by historical epochs. And, and the end of history was so short, it didn't actually, to my mind, have much relevance to anything. I mean, post 9-11 is, of course, a different uh, kettle of fish. Um, I wrote my book on globalization in 2010, and I presented positive and negative scenarios about how globalization and human rights might intersect. Uh, if I rewrote it now, I would be looking much more at the negative side, and I would be devoting, devoting more space to uh, in the international criminal uh, underworld, including uh, corruption, which, you, which are criminals. They're heads of state often, but they're criminals. Uh, I'd be devoting, devoting much more time to surveillance, to the problems of migration, and uh, as Tom Hartley said, um, climate migration. Um, the estimate I read by Ridolfo Stavenhagen was 400 million uh, expected climate migrants. And I think that's now an, an underestimate. There's going to be million, many more people like than that moving. And if we don't get rid of state boundaries, which we won't, it's going to be a mess. And then, of course, the effects of social media. I had no idea that social media would be so strong. But the other question I wanted you to ask me was what disciplinary studies subjects I would like human rights scholars to pay more attention to. 
So we talked about history and, and, and knowing more about Western history. But I think also we need, people should know more about economics. So I'm, I'm no genius on this stuff, but the number of times I have seen in economics or in human rights literature, a confusion of absolute income with level of inequality. And people who are just literally refusing to acknowledge, despite all of the evidence, that people's absolute incomes on the whole have been increasing since 1980. There's been a lot less absolute poverty. Now, in the short recent past, because of COVID, poverty has been increasing again. But there has been a significant improvement in people's incomes since about 1980. And people also insisting that all kinds of inequality have widened when they haven't. Inequality between countries is, is narrowing. Inequality among individuals within countries is widening. But even there, you have to be careful. One of the reasons for China and the Soviet Union is because they were actually living in artificially leveled societies. So you didn't have a high income, but what you had uh, in Russia, for example, Soviet Union was membership in the nomenclatura. So you had privileges. You had status-based privileges, dachas, you know, country houses, trips, better stores, and things like that. Um, people need to know a lot more about economic history. They should be reading about how countries actually develop and looking, as I said, on internal features. Whether we like it or not, no society that is rights protective and has developed has done so without uh, protection of private property. This is a really horrible one because how we get private property is by depriving other people of theirs. In Canada, Indigenous peoples, in, in, in Britain, by kicking people off, peasants off the land in the enclosures and so on. But you've got to have a private property regime, an efficient and a regulated market. And by regulated, I mean progressive tax, probably basic, uh, a basic income kind of thing, really strong controls on on uh, corruption. I mean, in the United States, for example, I think in the in the 70s, the highest income tax rate was 91 percent. And now it's down to about 30 percent, probably similar in, in Britain, if I had the figures. Britain and the United States are way at the bottom in the OECD rankings on social welfare. Canada is somewhere in the middle. But Britain and the United States are way at the bottom and efficient institutions and, and, and efficient bureaucracy and so on. And then sociology, I mean, the old fashioned type of sociology where you looked at social class, not everything is identity politics. Now, a lot of it is social class. And I find it quite objectionable in Canada where it's assumed that all white men are prejudiced or sort of privileged. You know, the, the beggars that I stop, stop and talk to on the street in my neighborhood are white men who have suffered probably from mental illness, who have suffered from abuse. Um, it is simply not true that all white men are, are privileged. And um, one should be looking at social class. In, in the United States, I read recently, the most, the wealthiest group in the United States now is now is Hindus, brown people. Not every Hindu. But a lot of them are, 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 you know, a lot of the wealthiest people are Hindus. So you also need to know more about statistics than I do. But you at least need to know about statistical correlations, which are much more subtle than the idea of inter intersectionality. Intersectionality has people thinking you're a, you're a brown skinned female. Therefore, you are not privileged. Statistical correlations would look at your income your education, your occupation, and see what happens there. I'll give you an example. A recent study by a white man and a black woman scholar in Canada, I just want to make this clear, showed that the male children and grandchildren of non-white immigrants in Canada earned less than their white counterparts. But the female children and grandchildren of non-white immigrants, immigrants in Canada did not earn less than their white counterparts. So then you have to ask yourself what's going on there. And it could be that there's just a lot more racism against black men than, than against black women. Or it could be that black women are more likely to finish their education. We don't know. I, they didn't explain it. 
But I think that um, the identity politics rhetoric obscures the reality. Again, it's it's the reality of the West in the past. There is the reality of, of people in the present. Um, even in places like Africa, one of the people I was reading on reparations said that many African leaders now are the descendants, not of slaves, but of slave traders. Now, I did read about a book about that by a, a, a Sudanese scholar about Sudan in the 70s. And the, the evidence was fairly clear there that the slave traders, former slave traders, were in, were, were in power. So I think the, the latest, um, the person that just won the Nigerian election, I believe, came from a slave trading family and uh, has an incredibly large amount of private wealth that it, came yeah. from. Yeah. And, yeah, and probably if you looked at people like Buhari, before him, you might find the same kind of uh, background because uh, they are emirs from the north. They're from that em class of emirs of, of, of rulers from the north, as far as I know. I um, hope I'm not saying anything here that I shouldn't be saying without checking it with my footnotes yet beforehand. But um, anyway, so so that was the one question I really, really wanted uh, to answer was where we don't have enough knowledge. And I found that when I wrote my book on globalization, I wrote a whole chapter trying to explain how it was possible for people's absolute incomes to rise at the same time as, as inequality widened. And I mean, it, it just went over the heads of a lot of people. They couldn't see that that, that, that was possible. Um, although I tried to simplify it as much as I could. So anyway, I think those are the other the other questions. I hadn't really intended to read you the quotation from my my father, but I thought it illustrated Hannah Arendt perfectly. Um, he was saying in his own private way, not knowing anything about philosophy, <laughs> how he felt about things. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, you know in, in many ways uh, that's a, a wonderful um, representation of this whole conversation. Uh, you know, I, I think we've really started started an important dialogue here. Thank you so much for bringing such a clear-eyed account of the complexities that are implied in this space. Uh, you know, the, the pessimists who argue that it's the end times of human rights, they do sometimes seem to to hog the spotlight. Um, but I think you well, provide... the end time of human rights guy made a comment about... Uh... Florence Redding Nightingale that really, really annoyed me, referring to her as that lady with the lamp. And Florence Nightingale, which uh, some people know, was in fact a major intellectual in the 19th century and a major public health advocate. She was responsible for public health reforms in Britain. She was writing statistical papers uh, on Indian land tenure. But of course, since she was a woman, she was not allowed to uh, present her papers at the Royal Statistical Society. And because she was a woman, she had to feign illness for years and years and years so that her parents wouldn't bother her to try to get married and arrange flowers all day long. And, you know, Florence Nightingale, she'd been a man, might well have been Prime Minister of Britain, for better or for worse. But she was a lot more than a lady with a lamp. Just as uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was a lot more than the widow of the uh, of the the president of the United States, and I, I do find a certain amount of neglect still uh, of the contributory role and the the actual uh, knowledge and um, influence of women, both in our society and in other societies. I mean, that sounds like a really important PhD project. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should write a PhD on all the women who were influential in formulating the UDHR. Not just Eleanor Roosevelt and those two women I mentioned, but the women who were the who were spokespeople for their countries, probably because maybe it could be that countries just thought, oh, it's not important, give it to a woman. But somebody should write a PhD on that. I'm surprised it doesn't exist. I well, absolutely agree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, look, Rhoda, thank you so much. I think you provided a very strong rebuttal to those who might think that someone who argues for the universality of human rights is naive. <laughs>
Um, I think you've really grounded the importance of human rights in real human experience and in real human suffering. It's yeah. not it's not actually that complex. I'm a part-time scholar of genocide studies. I taught courses on comparative genocide for years. This isn't naivete. This is realism. Look at the real world. Look at who is being mur murdered and tortured and go from there. <laughs> we will. Okay. okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Really appreciate right. your time. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.